Hey everybody, welcome to Overkill Projects, Walt here. Uh, last time on part one, we just took a look real quick at the uh, Paddock PMS 150C, which is also commonly known as the three cent microcontroller. Today, we're gonna take a look at some code examples to highlight uh, some of the weirdness of programming this thing. Uh, and hopefully you can, uh, you know, maybe pick up some tips and tricks to avoid the pitfalls that I ran into when I started working with this thing. So, okay, here's part two. One of the weird things about these microcontrollers is that you have to use Paddox IDE to program them. You can't use Visual Studio or Kyle or Eclipse or whatever tools you might be used to, uh, which can be a limitation, but I will say that it's relatively straightforward to learn and it does have some nice features. Uh, it integrates well with the uh, debugger that's present on the ICE and all that good stuff. So as far as that goes, it's really not that big a bottleneck. What I think is a bigger deal is that you actually have to program these things uh, in what Paddock calls mini C, which is kind of like C, but is definitely not C as we will soon see right up here. Let's take a look at a quick example here. So a feature that uh, you know you might be used to using uh, if you've used the C language to program microcontrollers uh, is just using arrays. It's sort of like, that's one of the more basic features of the C language. And you can kind of use arrays in this mini C, although they work uh, very differently or they don't work as I would expect them to. So you can see up here that I declare an array and it has these five values values stored in it. I also have these two indexing variables that you'll see below. And then I have this uh, word here, P, which I'm going to use as a pointer down below, as you will see. Now, if this was just regular C, you would expect to be able to iterate through the values in this array using the index. So let's take a look and see what happens if you try to do that. You can see that's what I'm doing on this line. I just take the index variable I, I'm increasing it every time we go through the while loop, and then I'm going to increase the value in the array for that index by one every time we go through. So then if we go ahead and save it and build this thing, we see, oh, that we get ourselves an error. Uh, the error is specifically here need a value. Uh, and you can see that it's pointing to the line that's doing pretty much all the processing. And so now this is actually an issue across the board with mini C with programming these things is that you, have, you can't really use an indexing variable in the arrays at all, or you get some sort of error. Uh, it's always this here need a value error. But if you are an experienced C programmer, you probably say no big deal. We will just simply use uh, pointers to deal with the arrays instead of using index notation. And you'd be right. And that is the solution to this thing, uh, but there are some other slightly weird issues. So let's take a look. So now let's try to approach this same problem using pointers. Like I said before, up here at the top of the program, you see I declared a pointer, this word P. Now in mini C, pointers have to be word. They can't be integer types or anything else. And actually what you're going to see right here, if you are a C programmer, is that this is not how you normally instantiate a pointer. There's no asterisk here. So really what's happening is I'm just making a word variable that's going to contain the address of the array memory. But there's no signifier here at all to tell the programmer what type of data we expect this pointer to hold, which is a little bit weird, and it means that you need to keep track of what you're doing. But now, jumping down to the implementation, you see that down here I'm using the plus equals operator in order to increment the value in the array. And then after we increment, since I have already incremented our i index value, value here, uh, we're going to have to include some sort of logic so that that rolls back over to zero uh, when it hits five. So here I have, you know, the modulo equals operator. So let's just save that and build it. And here we see that we get another error, which is syntax error happen. So we had a syntax error happen here on this line with the modulo equals operator. And that's because there is no modulo equals operator in mini C. So, okay, that's really not that big a deal. It's an operator that you're not going to use that commonly. So there are other options. And in fact, I have some highlighted down here. We'll comment that one out. And instead we can do this where we just use the modulo operator without, you know, combining it with the equal statement. So we just separated it out here. So now saving and building this, 
we get what is probably my favorite error in this IDE, which is the express is too hard to implement. So that is very interesting. I've never seen an error message like that. I actually find it kind of endearing. I like it, uh, but it doesn't get us any closer. And in fact, down here, even if you tried to assign i to another temporary variable and then, you know, use the modulo operator, we see that again, the express is too hard to implement. And now one more try, just commenting out those lines and uncommenting this one below, we can just try to divide i by five and place the value in j. Let's see what happens when we save and build that. Here we get a syntax error happen, and that's because there is no division functionality at all built into this microcontroller uh, in, well, at least not implemented in this mini C language. So you cannot use division at all, even to return an integer value like you might be used to doing in C on your microcontroller of choice. And so again, there are workarounds, and in fact, there's one right here, so I'll comment that out, and down here, we see the workaround. Uh, every time we get to five, we just simply subtract five from the index and then start over. And we can see now that this will actually work. It will build. And now we do get a couple of warnings here that are kind of funny uh, that uh, just tell us that some stuff isn't going to be used. Uh, so you always get this uh, warning that says not be used and be bypassed. That means that you have declared something that you're not actually using in the, uh, in the build. But down below that, you can see some handy information uh, it lets you know the, the status of your memory, the checksum. You can see how much code you've used up and how much remains. Uh, all that's really good. And if we come over here and we go to uh, debug, you can just hit F5 to do that as well. We see that the debug window is actually pretty handy. Up here you have the, uh, the assembly output. Uh, here is your code as before. Over here on the right, we have all the registers listed out so you can see what's going on. Uh, there's also this RAM tab down here. We have all the stuff that's in memory. You know, we have local memory here. Uh, down here, we can uh, specify variables that we want to watch and track. I already have a few in there. So if we go ahead and scroll down and insert a breakpoint, then we can debug as we normally would. You can see the array values over here are all exactly what we expect them to be. Um, you can keep a, a keep track of our index uh, and our pointer value and all that good stuff. So now if I just loop through the code, we see the, uh, the index increased by one. We see all the values in the array slowly increase as well, and it works exactly as we expect. So now jumping over to another example, I put together uh, a Blinky that uses interrupts to show a few other weird things uh, about Mini-C and really these microcontrollers in general. So up top here, you can see that I've set up PA4 uh, as my output pin. That's gonna do the actual blinking of my green LED. So one of the things you have to do in order to use a pin as an output with these microcontrollers is to disable it as an input, and that's uh, what I've done in these two lines here. But you'll notice here that I use two lines Lines to write to this register. Uh, in the first line, I make a, uh, a temporary variable, let's say, that holds the value of the PADIER register. And then I actually assign that value to the register on the next line. Now, the reason that I'm doing that is something that's really weird and I think unique to these microcontrollers is that the PADIER register is right only. So if we take a look at the data sheet uh, for this, which is right here, then when we take a look at the PADIER register listing, you can see here under read write, it is listed as WO, which is write only. Now, it's not weird that there's maybe a write only register. Other microcontrollers have uh, functionality where you can't directly change a register. So that's not weird. But what is weird is that there's no way, literally no way to read the hardware in order to get the value of the registers once they've been programmed. And so here, if we are debugging and we come through and we just let the code run for a second, and then I hit stop, so we're somewhere in the middle of the code, and then we take a look over here at the register values, they say, write only. So how weird is that? Not only are they write only, but even in the debug window, they list the registers, even though there's no possible way for you to read the values. 
that's kind of super weird. So the workaround for this obviously is you can assign a temporary variable like I did here, P-A-D-I-E-R val, and then we can just put that into our variable tracker down here at the bottom and we see the value here. And then you can keep track of that in case you actually did want to change it uh, after some sort of processing. Okay, now going back, uh, taking a look here, I set up both timers. I have the 16-bit timer set up here. Uh, it's going to use the system clock divided by 64. Uh, and you can see here I have it set to interrupt on bit 11. I'll explain that in a second. And then below that I have uh, timer 2 running on the low speed internal clock. I just have that counting up to 256 and then spilling over and starting over again at zero. Uh, but you can see here that I have this INTEN uh, register set to one for the T16 position and set to zero for the TM2 position. Now this is the interrupt enable register. So taking a look at the uh, data sheet, we can see that there are two registers that make up the interrupt system. There's an interrupt enable register and an interrupt request register. So I have the interrupt enable register enabled for timer 16 and disabled for timer 2. So it's important that you keep track of that. This is not an uncommon setup. You might set up a timer, but then not actually plan on using it unless some other condition is met. And up here, having the interrupt on bit 11 means that the uh, T16, the 16-bit timer, is going to count up to 2 to the 11th or uh, 2048 before it trips over and gives us an interrupt. Okay, so... There are a few weird things here. The first one is this interrupt on bit 11 thing. If you take a look again at the data sheet, and you can see here in the data sheet that uh, for the T16 register uh, that you pick your interrupt source, but that it's on one of the uh, upper eight bits or in the upper byte of the count register. So you can't pick very specific values. You have to pick powers of two greater than uh, two to the seventh. So 256 or above. Now at this point, the data sheet kind of goes quiet. It doesn't tell you where bit eight to bit 15 even live uh, in case you wanted to check them. And you'll also notice that the interrupt event happens whenever the selected bit is changed, which means you'll have it trigger when it goes from zero to one and from one to zero. So you really have to keep track of what you're doing. Otherwise, you're going to be involved in interrupts that you might not have wanted to, you know, get included. And after much experimentation, uh, I kind of just had to figure out that these bits 8 through 15 are actually on this register itself. It turns out that this register is actually an entire word long or 16 bits long. And so if you access bits 7 through 15, they hold the timer counter values. What that also means, though, is that you never get access to the lower 8 bits, the lower byte, of the count register, uh, so you can't do very accurate timing with the 16-bit register. Okay, so now to track down the last major issue with this setup here, and one of the weirder things that I've found here, I guess, uh, so when you scroll down to the interrupt routine, the uh, ISR, interrupt service routine, is what you normally see this listed as, there's only one, and you're not passing it any values, which means that uh, down here, you're just going to get some great big bowl of interrupt spaghetti that you're going to have to unwind yourself. Now, the default code, uh, which I'll show you, is in the project that we just left uh, with the arrays, is this. Uh, they just sort of give you the shell of an interrupt uh, for timer 16. And you can see you check the interrupt request register for timer 16. Uh, if that exists, then an interrupt has been set. Uh, and then you can go in. That's the first thing you want to clear out. And then down here is where you would do your actual processing. You know, you would do something, fill that in. But you'll notice the only condition that they're checking is the int RQ register for the specific device. And obviously you could change this device, but all they're checking is int RQ, which is weird because now when we go back to the previous example, the Blinky example, we're going to see that we run into a big problem. So if we come down here and we process the interrupt code for T16, which is going to blink the light, Somewhere in the interim, it could happen that TM2 has 
overflown. It is counted to 256. In that case, even though I have up here the interrupt enable register set to disabled for timer two, the int RQ register is actually going to have a value of one for TM2 every time it overflows. And that's not going to be reset until this code executes. So even though T16 is the thing that triggered the interrupt and is the reason that we're in the interrupt service routine, the code for timer two is also going to get executed. That's a big problem. Now the fix is super easy and I'm kind of surprised that it's not in the example code that they have uh, when you generate a new project. Now the workaround for this is simple. You just need to include the interrupt enable uh, register in the condition uh, that gets checked to see if this code should run. Uh, and so now you just need to do this for every single routine you have, unless you do happen to have some code that you want run every time any interrupt is triggered. Uh, and some other conditions are met, maybe. I don't know, it's very confusing. There's probably a way to leverage that uh, to your advantage to write slightly more concise code in certain situations, but uh, it's very confusing if you're used to programming microcontrollers uh, in other environments. And so now that we have that in there, if this was to run, uh, since the interrupt enable uh, is zero for TM2. This whole statement is going to evaluate to false, which means that the code in here would not run. And now we're safe. Uh, that's not going to be executed by accident when the, uh, the T16 timer goes off and vice versa. Whew. So that was a lot of information about the PMS 150C. Hopefully uh, you learned some tips and tricks that you can take with you uh, in case you ever plan on working with this uh, microcontroller yourself. Uh, and if you did in fact learn something or you just enjoyed yourself, make sure you hit the thumbs up down below to let me know that you liked the video. Uh, check the description for links to the code, which I'll put in a GitHub repository, as well as links to everything else that we talked about today. Uh, comment down below, subscribe. I hope you enjoyed yourself because I know I did and I will see you next time.